You're listening to Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast. Deal by Deal invites you to conversations with experienced independent sponsors and other private equity professionals. Join McGuire Woods partners Greg Hover, Jeff Brooker, and Rebecca Brophy as they explore middle market private equity M&A to provide you with timely insights and relevant takeaways. Welcome to Deal by Deal, a podcast for independent sponsors and others in the private equity community. My name is Greg Hover. I'm a partner in the private equity group at McGuire Woods. I'm joined on this episode by my partner, Jeff Brooker, in our Dallas office, also in the private equity group. Today's episode is going to be the first part of a two-part series where we talk about best practices for letters of intent. So this episode is going to focus on the letter of intent for the M&A deal, which is entered into by a buyer and a potential seller that talks about the high-level terms of that acquisition. The second episode and part of the series will be a discussion of the equity term sheet where an independent sponsor hammers out the deal with the capital partners that are investing together with that, um, that independent sponsor. So with that, I'll kick it over to Jeff to give us a, a high-level overview of some important points. You know, as we talk about all the points in these LOIs and how you know there's potential pitfalls, I would encourage you pick up the phone and and call your lawyer. Call you know, we as lawyers are happy to review these LOIs typically off the clock for our clients and our prospects. It gets us an opportunity to know our you know new clients and what they're thinking about and how they like to do deals. It gives them an opportunity to see how we work and how we approach things. It's a great win-win for everybody. And so I, I would encourage folks, please reach out. We're happy to help. So how do you balance as a buyer those two competing interests of trying to get to exclusivity with a seller before someone else does? And also hammering out a meeting of the minds such that you can go to capital providers and show them that, that you do have a deal. And I think it's a little different if you're thinking about an independent sponsor trying to get to an LOI with a, with, as opposed to just a strategic or a traditional PE firm. But how do you think about that tension? Yeah, I mean, I think it, that it touches on a little bit of what I said about you know, how specific do we want to be. When I'm representing a seller... I want to be very specific about all the terms that I care about. And so I want to hold the buyer's feet to the fire because once I give exclusivity as a seller, I've lost some of my leverage. Totally agree. Right. And you don't want to start down the road, start spending resources on a deal and then have the buyer propose new or different terms than what you expected. Or if you if you punt on an issue, I think... Punting on an issue is probably most of the time in, more in buyer's favor than in seller's favor. Sometimes a buyer just wants to get the exclusivity and live to fight another day. And that is kind of an art of, you know, sometimes it, it's better to fight that battle under exclusivity to get it under exclusivity today and, and get the best deal you can later. Or, you know, maybe you need to do more diligence to truly understand and digest the issue to know how exactly how you want to document it. Or, I mean, sometimes you just, you understand as buyer that the leverage shifts in your favor once you get exclusivity and you feel it's better to fight that fight later. And that's, you know, that's exactly why when I'm on the sell side, I want to, I want to flush out those material terms. I don't want to fight that fight after that leverage shift has occurred. That That's kind of how I think of, of level of specificity here. Greg, anything, any, any further thoughts or anything to add there? No, I, I totally agree with you. I think that, you know, in your average deal, all other things being held equal, the LOI, pre-signature of the LOI, that's when the seller has more leverage and power. And then once exclusivity is given to the buyer, then it shifts a bit. And so, I, you know, if you're a seller, I think you everything that's important to you, I mean, you don't want to slow down the process by writing down every single deal term, but everything important you want to be set forth in the LOI and buyer is fine. There's an art to what to punt on and what not to. So great. Thanks for covering that. Let's talk about what, what should be binding and what is binding. 
what's properly binding and what's properly not. Because that's another one of the the things that I think people there can be some some misunderstanding about. So you maybe maybe you want to you want to grab that topic and run with it a bit. By and large, the majority of an LOI is not going to be binding. An LOI is going to set forth terms relating to purchase price, structure, things like that that set forth the party's best understanding of the deal, but the deal may change. But at the back of the LOI, there will be a provision that states which terms are binding in the letter of intent. And the three primary topics there are going to be exclusivity. If there's any confidentiality provisions in the LOI, they might be in a separate document, uh, in a separate non-disclosure agreement. And also expenses, uh, who is going to cover whose expenses. And so let's cover the uh, the exclusivity, I think, later on in this discussion. But yeah, those are the the binding terms. I get asked sometimes by folks, can I make this provision binding? And what they're referring to are actual deal terms because they're afraid that you know the other party is going to retrade on the terms of the LOI. And, and unfortunately, it's, you really can't. It's the LOI, when it's, when it's talking about deal terms and economics and structure, it's setting forth a, a mutual understanding and kind of a moral obligation. But I can't, I can't make it so that the, the terms that you put in the LOI themselves like, are, are actually enforceable and prevent a retrade. And, and that's simply because it's just a summary that uh, the, these, these terms are just a summary of, of the terms and not the actual flushed out legal terms, which you need definitive documentation for. Good example would be like for you think about preemptive rights, you know, everyone has an idea of exa- of what that means. You know, the members in the LLC or the stockholders in a, in a corporation, you know, they get when the corporation or the LLC issues new equity, the equity holders get to buy their pro rata piece of that equity. And so if I said preemptive rights in, in, the, in the LOI, we, we kind of know what that means. And as lawyers, we know what is customarily carved out because there's customary carve outs for things like the management incentive plan or like rollover equity and acquisition. But you typically wouldn't spell that out in the LOI, nor would you say, okay, well, maybe the management equity wouldn't get preemptive rights, which it would be customary. Customarily, they don't. And there has to be, the company's going to offer the equity, then there's a certain period of time to exercise on it. And then there's a process for how it's purchased. And then there's a period of time for during which the company can sell equity that's not bought. And so all of that is baked into the concept of preemptive rights, but I can't, no judge would step in and say, well, you two parties, because you put preemptive rights in your LOI, have to agree to all these specific terms, which I, the judge, am going to write. And so because that remedy is not available, the parties really do have to agree. And if they can't come to an agreement, then you ultimately just don't have a deal. And so, you know, I know that's a bit of a long-winded example, but I was ho- I was hopeful that that would be clarifying in that Deal terms, unfortunately, can't really be made binding, and they're not binding until we actually have definitive signed documents. Yeah, no, c- completely agree with that, Jeff. It, it it is a it's a moral authority um, type of dynamic, but it, it is pretty powerful, and, it, and it's interesting to think as you look at LOIs, um, there's some strategy there, right? Because you'd rarely have you know, the parties agree to a five-year restrictive covenant in an LOI, and then one party just say, no, actually, I just want that to be three, even though it's just, you know, black and white, it was it was in the LOIs five years. But there's a couple of different provisions where parties will hedge and they're, they'll say subject, you know, subject to ongoing review, et cetera. And, and the interesting one, I was going to touch on later, but a common approach when you're talking about purchase price, which is probably the most important term in an LOI, is that parties will commonly state the purchase price as $100 million, for example, and then they'll say that that's based on a 10x multiple, and they're assuming there's, there's $10 million of EBITDA, subject to ongoing review of the buyer. And so that's a provision where they're sort of set a buyer setting up an ability to really scrub that 
that EBITDA and potentially have an argument down the road that the purchase price should be lower and not be accused of a, of a retrade or of going against sort of the spirit of, of what was agreed in the LOI. So yeah, there, I agree. There, there's an art to that. And uh, uh, you, you definitely see that dynamic. I usually try to get that one out as seller. Um, <laughs> yes. But but I mean, the reality is that both sides, if EBITDA materially mo- it moves up or down, you know, there's a risk of retrading. And that's because, you know, folks don't want to pay too much or leave a bunch of money on the table if the EBITDA is truly moved. I understand why you want that out as a seller, but I see the logic of it as a, as a buyer. And I probably see it more, more often, uh, more often included than, than not. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and always try to get it as a buyer, obviously. Maybe we step through Jeff, just sort of page by page, like what an LOI would look like some of the some of the key terms that are usually covered from sort of start to back, we already talked about exclusivity, which is at the back of the LOI usually. But but first and foremost, one of the one of the terms you'll see set out or not set out is the structure of the of the transaction. And as a buyer, you're probably first thinking about what the purchase price is going to be and thinking about your headline number. And many times the the structure of the deal, and, and I'm talking about with structure, you know, wh- what is the what is the legal form of the seller? Is it a corporation or an LLC? What's the tax classification of that? And is this going to be a stock deal or an asset deal? And and this is where many times I'll I'll get an LOI from a client that had not talked to a lawyer beforehand, and it just it states a purchase price and it just talks about an acquisition and it's not a stock or an asset deal. Yeah, or or, or sometimes right, Greg is even not consistent in the way that it speaks of you know, kind of conflates equity terms with asset terms and just is not internally consistent. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that, and another thing, even if if you sort of spell out the terms, sometimes people won't, will ask, well, what's the tax classification of the seller? And we won't really know. And, and we need to drill down and ask that question to really, I mean, the, the goal is to get a meeting of the minds at this LOI stage. And I bring this up because if your target is a C Corp and probably the most egregious example, but, and your LOI just states it's, it's an acquisition in the buyer's mind, it's an asset deal. And in the seller's mind, it's a stock deal. Those are two very different transactions from the seller's perspective, uh, millions of dollars worth of a difference there between, you know, depending on the, the different structures. So I would say if, if possible, and if strategically it works, you do want to talk about the structure. You want to reach out to a lawyer and have him or her reach out to their tax partner to just drill down like, okay, this is the, these are the different parties, how they're classified from a tax perspective, and, and it'll be an asset deal versus stock deal, et cetera. You can really stub your toe here if you don't do this right. Greg's example is one example, but there's a whole bunch of examples where you know, if you don't get tax structuring right or the deal structuring right, because there may be their taxes is always a concern, but there can also be uh, regulatory consents, third party consents, other things to think about that we need to think about it at, at this stage and try to make a transaction that's actually going to be feasible and that is tax efficient. Give a quick overview of, of like asset deal versus equity deal from a buyer's perspective and seller's perspective, which one? Holding other things equal, which ones do you prefer? So in an asset deal, your seller is the actual company and each of its subsidiaries that actually hold any assets. The buyer is just buying assets and then typically only assuming very limited liabilities. Typically, the pre-closing liabilities remain behind with the seller. And then any assets that aren't specified also remain behind with the seller Seller then keeps uh, its tax liabilities. Uh, it make you know it is more likely to require consents to transfer contracts and transfer any licenses or registrations. It's from a risk allocation perspective, it's better for the buyer and worse for the seller. The buyer will get a, t- a step up on the basis of the the assets, but the, the seller because it's you know, the, the seller itself is the entity that those dollars, those purchase price dollars go into the entity. 
and then they have to be distributed or dividended up. And so if you've got a corporation, you can have potentially two layers of tax there. And so it can be highly tax inefficient for, uh, for a seller to do it that way if you're in a C-Corp. In an equity deal, the sellers are the actual equity holders. And they, they just sell you know, the, the stock or the LLC units to the buyer. And then everything in that entity, both assets and liabilities, as well as if it's a corporation, it's all of its tax attributes all come with the uh, all come with the company over to, and then so the the buyer inherits all of that, and then typically we've got you know in both deal structures we have an indemnity structure, but um, there's no excluded liability concept where the, the pre closing liabilities. It, like in an asset deal, remain with the seller. Um, in the equity deal, it's really just if it's a breach of a representation or warranty, then there's an indemnity construct for it. If we find specific indemnities, you know, known liabilities that we find in diligence, typically buyers will require sellers to indemnify for those. But so that the at risk allocation is a, is a little bit better for the seller in an, in an equity deal. But if you're in a C corp, for instance that double layer tax goes away, the buyer can get a step up in the, the tax basis of the assets for the cash portion of the purchase price in some deal structures uh, with an equity deal, but not all. And so if that is something that the, the buyer's looking for, you really, at that point, it really behooves you to, to reach out to counsel and make sure you're, you're getting what you expect to get. That was a great summary, Jeff. Um, as I what I did think about it, I, I probably think about tax first when I'm thinking about structure because it's got to be generally workable. But then, yeah, if I'm buyer, you know, if there's no third party consents, et cetera, uh, there are going to be major issues. An asset deal is better. I sometimes say that you've you've won half the battle by moving to an asset deal as a buyer because it's you know pre closing liabilities generally just stay with the seller. I often explain, you know, in, in in stock deals, yeah, you, your protection is you're, you're generally stepping into the shoes of all those liabilities. So your protection is really the, the rep package that you're getting. And so that's why you got to spend a lot of time on what are those reps and warranties. Part of the difference there too is in the asset deal, the, the liability actually remains behind. Whereas in the equity deal, it actually moves over with you. And so third parties out in the world can actually look to the buyer in an equity deal or you know to the company, right? And say no, you know, you are the one who owes me this money, and then the buyer who is has a right to indemnification needs to be able to collect on that indemnity from the equity holders, and that can be sticky because you've got, you know, they are your management, and a lot of times, uh, you know, and and it's it's not easy to get folks to just cut you checks for things that they may have done, even if you've got them, you know, even if you've got them dead to rights. That might be a good quick segue into, and I think it's a structural point, the rise of rep and warranty insurance, that obviously that impacts how you're going to draft the LOI. It impacts risk allocation and it it helps you not have to go to your, you know, your rollover sellers and your management, et cetera. Jeff, do you want to just speak a little bit about, you know, how often you see an RWI in the marketplace and how does that impact negotiating the LOI? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I I see it pretty much always if the enterprise value is over 30 million maybe always it's a bit strong but uh, far more often than not in today's market when it's under 30 million I, you know i've seen it as low as even like 10 million but i think it becomes a harder and harder thing to justify the smaller the deal size and so i'd say under under 30 it becomes probably less and less common as you get smaller and smaller and then you want to build that. You want to know this upfront whether you're going to get the rep and warranty insurance as part of the deal, or if you're going to seek it, because it really does the it it impacts the indemnity package. And typically, the indemnity package is set forth in the LOI. So you know you're going to want to know which direction you're going, and mention it specifically. I have had some transactions that are small enough that they they think okay well we'll we'll pursue RWI but we're not necessarily going to get it or going to commit to it and in that case what i have actually seen sometimes in the LOIs is a bifurcated path it's it'll say 
you know, if we if we ultimately are able to get our an RWI policy in place, this is how it's going to look for risk allocation. And then if we don't, this is how it's going to look. And so it's kind of you know you you're not locked into either approach, but you are locked into kind of a, a package. You're going to choose from menu A or menu B based on on whether the parties ultimately get RWI. And one thing you do spell out of the LOI typically on RWI is is who's going to pay for it. What, what are you seeing on that front? Yeah, I mean, more often than not, I think in today's deal environment, it, the buyer is paying for it. The it's just it's been a seller's market for a long time. That may be starting to turn as the economy starts to get a little shakier and the debt markets start to get shakier. That it starts to be shared more. I very rarely do I see seller pay a hundred percent. You know, I either see in in a deal that is an attractive deal with a lot of interest. Like if you're in an auction, for sure, as a buyer, you're going to be paying for the RWI. If you've got a proprietary deal, but it's a pretty attractive asset that you know of, otherwise would have a lot of interest, you're probably as part of your 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 package going to have to pay for that as well. The assets may be a little less attractive, or maybe they're the sellers a little less sophisticated. Then you you might start to look to split the the RWI cost. But I, I I I can count probably on one hand the number of times I've ever seen seller actually pay for it. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen that. I mean, my counsel is usually if a buyer is able to just factor that ballpark cost into their purchase price and just you know as you add up the other items that, that a buyer is going to pay for it, together with the, the purchase price, just fold that in and buyer pay for it. It usually just reduces the friction because you're going to get asked to pay for it either way. Totally hear you. Well, one other question. I don't want this to become a total RWI discussion, but we typically decide at the LOI stage, if you're going with RWI, whether to do a, a no seller indemnity type of policy or a or sort of a more typical uh, construct where there's a 0.5% retention and escrow is held for a short term. Jeff, what are, what are you seeing on on that front? Yeah, so the the retention, the total retention there, right, would be typically one percent of enterprise value, and then the the customary construct when that's split is buyer will absorb the first half of that as the deductible, and that's a true deductible. That's only applies to breaches of ordinary reps where there is no fraud. So it wouldn't if there's fraud. That doesn't that that sharing doesn't count, and if there's if it's a breach of fundamental reps, then that sharing typically doesn't count either. So the first you know half a percent in when in in the ordinary reps with no fraud, typically the buyer will eat that, and then the second half typically will come from the sellers out of an escrow. You'll hear referred to sometimes as a sliver escrow because it's pretty you know, compared to like a five or ten percent of enterprise value that the, the kind of old, the the non RWI typical way of doing things, this escrow is a lot smaller. Uh, yeah, how, how how often are your buyer clients going out with a no seller indemnity approach where they're structuring the purchase agreement such that the buyer uh, essentially pays that entire one percent retention and the seller doesn't have to leave anything behind in an escrow, not even you know half of the retention. I guess I'd say I see it a lot both ways, and I I counsel clients a lot of times, you know, if they're on the fence about this issue, they should probably just give the the no retention. It's not ultimately that much money. Build it in your price up front if you can. It makes it much easier to negotiate the reps because the seller truly does not have skin in the game. Their counsel should be making sure that they're able to make truthful reps and uh, they're not, you know, there's, there's no fraud, but you really the the negotiation of the purchase agreement becomes much simpler, as well as you never have to make it. You never have to make a or an indemnity claim against your management. You know, and if your sellers aren't going to be part of management, you know, you can remove that consideration. But if they are, it's a real consideration that you don't even want to. You don't have to make a claim against them, even if it's for a small amount of money, because it's still it's some money that they otherwise would have. And people don't like you know, effectively you're you're making a claim against them, which is it's not litigation, but it's litigation like. And you know, people don't like that. And it it has a risk of 
of souring a relationship. And so if you think you can absorb that half a percent, uh, you know, I, I think it's often a good idea. The flip side to that is if seller has no skin in the game on the reps, if you're worried about they're not going to care about the scheduling and they're not going to, they're not going to be invested in that, that, I mean, there is that moral hazard there. You know, if they've got competent advisors, I think the lawyers will typically keep them on the straight and narrow and make sure that they're not doing anything they shouldn't. They're providing all the diligence, being diligent in the way they schedule, et cetera. But that's that's the way I think about it. So I, I, I think short answer, I see it a lot both ways, but also goes back to leverage a lot and how attractive the asset is just like, you know, whether you're going to get RWI in the first place, right? If you're in an auction, you're probably giving this, if it's a really attractive asset, it's more likely than not. I think you're probably giving it. I I agree. I, I think it all comes down to leverage and how competitive the process is. I mean, the other, the other trend I'm seeing over the last handful of years in competitive processes, uh, I would say in the more traditional uh, RWI setup, if there was a breach of a rep of a fundamental rep that went above the RWI coverage, call it ten percent or 20, up to twenty percent of the enterprise value, then that excess, if it was a fundamental rep, the sellers would have to stand behind that and pay that. And in a no seller indemnity approach, the buyer would essentially have to pay that that overage over the the coverage policy. So again, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of buyers just live with that risk of a, of a potential fundamental rep breach and that they would be on the hook. Jeff, do you want to step through maybe just a couple other terms in an LOI that are particularly noteworthy? So we talked about structure, we talked about purchase price, and then to the extent your purchase price has any, any structured items to it, like a seller note, an earn out, Anything like that, we would we want to make sure that we are building that in with pers- with enough precision into the the document that there's uh, a meeting of the minds. Typically, the doc- the companies are are bought on a debt free cash cash free basis with an ordinary course a level of working capital. So you're typically going to want to make that all clear in, in your your LOI. Any type of employment and equity incentive arrangements for the go forward management. You know, to the extent that go forward management is part of the selling group, I think you want to you want to lay that out as well. I mean, it, you don't have to get into tremendous detail, but I, I you know some detail. The non compete, I think you want to make sure that you know in a middle market private equity transaction, I see a five year non compete with from all sellers who are not institutional investors and are taking you know any material amount of consideration. I see that almost universally. You want to lay that out because some sellers will try to will try to negotiate you down on that, and then as well as if there's anyone that is going to fight you on the non compete, uh, I'd like to know that up front. Exclusivity. Let's talk a little bit about exclusivity, Greg, because it's really that is a super important point to to make sure you get right, and, and especially for for independent sponsors, right? There, there's some additional considerations. Yeah, you know, as an independent sponsor, the reality is that. If you don't have your capital provider locked down, or you're not the kind of independent sponsor that has a very reliable source of capital that you've gone to many times before and are pretty sure that you can get it locked up again very quickly, exclusivity it becomes very important because it's now becomes once you sign the LOI and the exclusivity clock, clock starts running, it's really a race against time to get that capital provider locked down with their LOI, and then they have to do whatever diligence they need and go through whatever process they need in order to be ready to fund when, when this is ready. So uh, it's, it's not uncommon at all for exclusivity to need to be extended uh, when there's an independent sponsor because the capital's not coming together fast enough. But you don't have a right to any more exclusivity than you're able to negotiate up front. And so that dance is a delicate dance for every for every independent sponsor to to dance here. Let's go through a couple of the elements here. You want to bind your seller, but you also want to you want to make sure that if you've got like an equity deal, for instance, that your majority equity holders also bound by this. And remember that you know no one's bound to anything unless they actually sign the document. And so if you're going to 
have, you know, ideally you'd have a majority equity holder sign this. If you're going to say that the company is the company and its equity holders, but you don't intend to get the equity holders to sign, you can have the company cause its equity holders. You say they, the company won't, and it will cause its equity holders not to. And then you want to make sure you're covering every kind of financing and M&A deal in your language, because you don't want them doing, even if it doesn't look exactly like your deal, you don't want them to, out there doing another transaction that's going to make your deal you know, difficult or impossible. So we, we cast a pretty broad net on the types of transactions they can't do. Uh, and they shouldn't be not just entering into agreements, but they shouldn't even really be having discussions. And so the language typically ends up being about a paragraph. And usually you're going to get somewhere between 30 to 90 days. It's pretty unusual, I think, to get more than 90 days. And even that's kind of on the long side. And, and one of the things you can do to try to bridge a gap between what the seller is willing to give and what you think you're going to need is by building in milestones. If you can't get the exclusivity you think you're going to need, maybe we try to build in extensions that if I do certain things, I get an automatic extension. Like if I deliver a purchase agreement before a certain period of time, then I automatically get an, if we're, if we're going to have an auto extend, then it needs to be a black and white trigger and not something that's gray or, or subject to interpretation. One other thing on exclusivity that is really important, you know, a lot of times sellers ask to be able to terminate exclusivity on written notice to the buyer. And at that point, you really don't have true exclusivity. It's kind of illusory because your seller at any point can, can cut it off. The, part of the point of exclusivity is to keep that seller off the market for a period and to have an incentive to only work with you. And if the deal, if something happens with your seller, then you have some time to try to, t- to talk them back into the boat. And if you don't have that, I think that's going to be prejudicial to your ability to get capital providers to, to really pay attention. And so that, that, that's the last point on exclusivity. One other point I would note is make sure that expenses is a binding provision. I have seen things where someone is trying to get some type of expense provision, uh, some type of cost sharing or shifting, and it's not in the binding provisions of the LOI, or maybe the LOI simply says at the beginning, you know, this is a non-binding LOI. And then it never in the document does it say, except for sections X, Y, and Z, which are binding. Those provisions, I would, I would say, you know, best to have experienced M&A counsel look at your LOI. You know, we are happy to do that at McGuire Woods. We're happy to do that uh, typically off the clock. That's a good investment of time for us. It's very helpful to our clients and, our, and to our prospects. Your binding provisions are properly binding. Your structure is working, et cetera. Yeah, totally agree, Jeff. It's a critical document, especially for independent sponsors who, together with the independent sponsor's track record and relationships, um, the independent sponsor is going out to market with, with this LOI. And this is what you're showing to your capital providers and, and, and this yeah. describes the terms of their investment. And if it looks inexperienced and amateurish, you know, that's going to be prejudicial to your ability to get this funded too. It's going to make you, it's going to make you look inexperienced. And one of these we can do is help clean it up, you know, and make it look like it should for a sophisticated set of parties. And so it's, it's another reason to just counsel, spend a few hours on this and get it right. It's going to increase the chance that you get your deal funded. I think very meaning. Absolutely. And Definitely feel free to reach out to, to myself or to Jeff. These LOIs, in addition to being important, being important, they're also kind of the fun part of, of my job and Jeff's job because you're looking at a new deal and you're structuring it and you're just putting thought on these high-level points. So, well, with that, I think this was a really helpful summary of, of this key document. You know, Jeff, thanks for joining and, and walking through it. Uh, appreciate your time and appreciate all of our listeners' times. We'll talk to you on the next uh, podcast. See you, Jeff. Thanks, Greg. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Deal by Deal, a McGuire Woods independent sponsor podcast.
To learn more about today's discussion and our commitment to the independent sponsor community, please visit our website at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.